I took the blue pill. Welcome everyone to day two of framing law and literature in slash from the global south. I am Hector Rojos. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Professor uh, Bernie Miter, who is going to do a very brief um, uh, intro remarks on this uh, day two before uh, receding to the foreground as the Zoom format dictates. This is a Zoom webinar. However, after the recorded portion of our meeting, we will be inviting uh, all participants who choose to join us as panelists so we can have more of a conversation. I'll pass the mic over to Professor uh, Bernadette Meider. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to say how pleased I am that this uh, panel and the panel yesterday are both happening. I think this is uh, such a wonderful conversation to be having about a number of um, issues that haven't been in the foreground uh, traditionally of law and literature scholarship and that I think um, you know have been uh, needing more um, discussion and representation uh, within the field. So I'm really um, thrilled. I'm not going to provide any kind of formal introduction to uh, the panelists, but I just want to say that we're um, so uh, thrilled to have um, Alberto Acosta here, uh, who uh, furnishes a kind of practical uh, lens on um, some of these uh, matters and is a kind of constitution drafter and uh, implementing a lot of the theoretical um, insights that uh, we'll also hear about, and uh, as well as Elise uh, Burtenthal uh, from Wake Forest uh, and Allison Bigelow from the University of Virginia. And uh, their work uh, all together uh, really, you know, kind of represents a lot of uh, the expansion of thoughts about constitutional rights um, into uh, rights of the environment, rights of indigenous people, and also even questioning um, the framework of rights itself. Um, and I think that I, these are areas that have been uh, really uh, understudied so far in the realms of law and literature. And so um, their work is really on the forefront of breaking a new ground in, uh, not to uh, use too much of an environmental metaphor, but uh, breaking uh, new ground in this, in this arena. So I'm just so pleased to have them and um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Bernie, for that warm introduction. I'm going to build a little bit of a bridge and tell you more about our speakers today, and then we'll get started with some uh, pre-circulated questions in this uh, roundtable format. Yesterday, we had Diana Esther Guzman Rodriguez, an associate professor of law from Universidad Nacional de Colombia, Lila Neri, a professor of English from Oxy Occidental College in LA, Beth Piatot, an MTL alumna, and an associate professor of Complet and Native American Studies at Berkeley, Marco Wan, who's also with us, uh, and several of you are with us at the moment, uh, the director of the program in Law and Literary Studies at the University of Hong Kong. One thing that emerged from our meeting yesterday was uh, what we could describe as a toolbox to think about uh, law and humanities uh, in a very capacious fashion um, in terms of, uh, and I'm you know, borrowing, borrowing language from yesterday, adjacency, so law, next to humanities, not so much law in the in literature or literature as law or all the other you know ways of um, associating these terms, but having the two counterpunctually work together, uh, resonate and produce uh, something new, something that that is really emerging. And what I see in in your respective um, you know works that is you know truly distinguished and accomplished is is something in, in that direction. Um, so, Introductions could be very long with speakers as distinguished um, as, as yourselves. Uh, I'm going to keep uh, those remarks very succinct. I just want to highlight uh, some aspects and, and then maybe get the conversation uh, going. Um, as uh, Bernie Meider was just mentioning, Alberto Acosta is someone who has uh, a, a really distinguished trajectory in the arena of implementing and of thinking uh, again, you know, on the ground, making uh, the juridical impossible possible. Um, and uh, he's one of the first uh, uh, people to articulate the notion of extractivism, which is so influential and, and that circulates uh, so much today. Um, I will also um, highlight that he has been uh, the a Minister of Energy and Mines in Ecuador. He has presided the Constituent Assembly there. 
Um, and uh, he is an affiliated at Flasco, uh, uh, that is you know, a, a really important uh, institution, the Latin American Faculty of, of Social Sciences. Um, I will um, mention also that Professor Alice Bertenthal um, is uh, a professor of law at Wake Forest University, uh, having joined the faculty under COVID, as we recently heard, uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, she has clerked for Judge Richard Pius on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and Judge Howard Matz on the U.S. District Court of the Central District of California, has worked for the ACLU and other um, I'm going to go ahead and describe as, as frontline uh, positions of uh, really doing things with the law. At the same time, um, I, 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 you know, we, we had a, a wonderful conversation, phone conversation recently, uh, at the same time that she thinks as a scholar of literature, giving her um, background in literature and in post-colonial literature at that. Um, I will um, recommend folks, if you haven't seen it, in Law and Literature, uh, Marco's uh, uh, journal, the wonderful article standing up for trees rethinking representation in a multi-species context. Uh, that's that's an article that I you know I, I would assign it uh, on a syllabus any, any day of the week. Um, Alison Bigelow uh, is an associate professor of Spanish at the University of Virginia, and what really drew us to uh, Professor Bigelow's uh, work is the um, multi-level, sophisticated, knowledgeable. Um, account she gives of um, mining in the colonial period in Latin America. And, and so you see the connection here. It's, it's really you know, quite amazing to have this constellation of scholars because when we talk about capitalist accumulation, the place where this pretty much starts is in Potosí. Uh, Jimena Briceño has also written about this, who is my co-chair in Materia. Um, and um, you know, this, this kind of accumulation is what will result, result, result pardon me, in extractivism. And then when Alberto Acosta is describing what happens later in neoliberalism, the term neo-extractivism is kind of like, you know, ready uh, to, to be deployed because you have this uh, broader uh, historical background. At the same time that um, in a different nomenclature, Professor Bigelow might be known as a uh, siglo de orista, um, and uh, in, in, uh, in Hispanic literature, we talk about uh, siglo de oro, the golden age. So as if, you know, there's uh, nothing to that metaphor, gold, no connection to Latin America whatsoever. Golden age specialist, great, just use that term. So I'm being a little flippant there, but just to put things into conversation. Um, her book, uh, Alison Bigelow's book is called Mining Language, Racial Thinking, Indigenous Knowledge and the colonial metallurgy in the early modern Iberian world. It is a, a very lauded and awarded book. Okay, the way we've organized this conversation is um, uh, Joseph Wager, um, Romina Weinberg, and myself, uh, we're being, organizing this event together, uh, sent our speakers some um, guiding questions. And um, the way we wanted to structure this roundtable was there is a question uh, to each of our speakers that has to do with their contributions to these debates. And then we have a couple of general questions for all of us to address. So we're going to be hearing uh, from our speakers um, individually, if you will, um, and, and then we'll, we'll get to um, have a chorus of voices. Having said that, um, as in real life or as in an in-person gathering, feel free to uh, interject, almost cut each other off, opine, debate, because that is what will make this, this Zoom gathering all the more livelier. Um, the first question that I'd like us perhaps to start uh, would be for uh, Alison, for Alison Bigelow, for Professor Bigelow. Um, I, I think um, the question would be, um, in what ways do the materialities of language and metals interact, this of course has to do with, with your previous work, and how does examining uh, languages and metals together allow us to perhaps get out of our scholarly comfort zones? So given that we're trying to think of law and humanities in, in from the global south, and given what you've seen in the colonial period, uh, what could you tell us, uh, Alison, over say something like seven minutes uh, max? <laughs> Well, thank you so much um, for the introduction. Thank you to everyone for being here. 
Um, it's a real honor to be here. I'm speaking to you from my house in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is on the land of the Monacan Indian Nation. Um, and thanks to the care of the Monacan people, uh, care for our land, air, and water, my university exists today. Uh, the University of Virginia was built brick by brick by enslaved African-American women and men. It was sustained for the first hundred years by free and enslaved African-Americans on stolen Monacan land. And it did not admit female degree seeking students until the 1970s. So this is the institutional context that I work in and that many of us are working against. And part of the reason why it's such a, a, an honor to be in conversation with everyone tonight. Um, when I thought about Hector's question, um, and thanks to Joe for pre-circulating it, my first response was, well, because what else are we going to do? So those of you who have spent any time in colonial archives, particularly in the Iberian world, you know that we face this real paradox. On the one hand, there is an abundance of documents. There is every kind of document you would ever want and maybe not want at all. And yet the documents very rarely tell us the kinds of things that we want to ask about them today. So for a long time, we've known, for instance, that the amalgamation method was practiced in Europe on a very small scale using um, partially processed metals that had to be pushed individually through a cheesecloth like fabric. And then somehow in Mexico in the 1550s, miners are able to process up to 2000 pounds of metal at once. And so we know that there's some sort of new technological idea happening around mining and the processing of metals. And we know that it happens in Mexico and we know when, but we've never been able to say concretely, this is because indigenous people are drawing on their knowledge of metals and mining and infrastructure in new ways within the Spanish empire. And the reason we've never been able to prove anything is because we don't have the sources for it. So the sources that we have um, are generally written by Spaniards, often um, religious officials, colonial administrators, who are either somewhat blind to indigenous and African diasporic forms of knowledge production or actively trying to silence those. Um, very occasionally you find in a source something like, un indio me dio esta muestra por Un negro me mostró esto, like a native man gave me this sample or an African man told me this. Um, but that's all we have. Whereas if Spaniards left very thick documentation about their ideas in elaborate uh, mining and metallurgical treatises, applications for patents for to be recognized as inventors. So the real challenge for us as historians of science and technology is to find a methodological approach that allows us to use those biased Spanish sources to tell us something about how things actually worked on the ground. And the, the approach that I came up with was a kind of language based or treating language as a material and treating material as evidence of language. If we know that um, we don't, we know what the documents don't tell us. So we needed ways of reading around those silences and, and sitting with the silence. Um, and by uh, analyzing the language that surrounds metals and mining, um, I think we're able to tell stories and to understand the history of ideas and of exchanges of knowledge in ways that a study of the materials on their own outside of their context don't always reveal. So language offers a way of putting the material into context. Um, so I do this in a couple different ways in my book. Um, in the section on gold mining in the Caribbean, I pair uh, an ordenanza, a law that was passed in 1525 in Spain to change the season of gold refining in the Caribbean from uh, a pretty safe like time that made sense November and December to June or July, which is like peak hurricane season. Um, and this change would really be prejudicial to gold mining and to processing, uh, which is curious given that the aim of the Spanish empire is to maximize gold production. And so, you know, the question as you sit with this document is why did the Spanish empire agree to change? Like, why did they put this into law? Why did they agree to this policy? Um, and where did this idea come from? And there's nothing really on the Spanish side that would suggest a seasonality of gold mining, but in Taino oral history, some of which are preserved in colonial sources, 
there's a very long tradition of thinking about golden metals as plants that have a particular season of growth and cultivation. And so by thinking about the language of the sources and the way that seasonality is informing colonial law, um, oral tradition, and technical reports, I was able to tentatively say, okay, I think that this law is changed because indigenous people, the Tainos of the region, are telling stories about the way that they process gold and Spaniards are looking for ways to maximize gold production and they think using native knowledge might be a way. So it's not that, they, that the Spanish empire changed the season of gold refining in La Española to honor native people. They probably did it for these extractive reasons, but the fact that they did it and documented it and that we have oral traditions documented elsewhere that we can put into dialogue gives us a kind of method, although very rough one, for telling a story that we haven't been able to tell in the past. Um, and that approach requires thinking of language as material and material as language and really um, challenging the traditional borders between the two. So I, I can stop there. In other parts of the book, I have other methods um, of using language as material, but I think that one will do. Uh, and that will keep me within seven minutes. So I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, I'm going to uh, pass the mic now, as it were, over to Alice. Um, and, um, and this, the order, by the way, which we're, we're progressing is just thinking of, of how um, your, your topics intersect. Um, you have written about how nature can claim and express uh, rights in the anthropocentric space of law. Uh, the question also having to do with your work would be what role does representation play within a non-anthropocentric conception of law? Uh, perhaps the notion of claim itself, um, to claim, right, as in to claim a right, uh, might be worth exploring. Um, Alice, the floor is yours. So first, I just also want to say thank you for having me. It, it is honor. Um, I'm humbled to be here. Um, I joke with my students, why do you write things? And I say it's because I have to give my mom something to read. But the honest reason is I, I write things so that I can be in conversation on, on in conferences like this. This is this is precisely the dialogue that that I want to be having. And it's it it's just a, a fantastic discussion. So so thank you for letting me be a part of it. Um, I want to start, I guess, in responding to your question, commenting on the frame that that's kind of explicit in your question, which is that when we think about protecting and progressing nature, we think about it doing so in terms of rights. And that frame makes sense in a world in which law or in which we believe law to be the primary means of shaping the world as it ought to be. Assertions of rights are among the strongest tools of law. Rights are seen as more than privileges and they command protection by the courts. So as we've grasped for ways to stop disintegration of our climate, to stop contamination of soils and rivers, to stop clear cutting of forests and poaching of endangered species, it's only natural, and I use that word intentionally, it's only natural that we've turned to law and the discourse of rights to do so. Um, of course, we, we, we have, I, by my count, six countries, um, a, a handful of US states that, that have legally recognized the rights to nature. And in general, the media, and I think a lot of scholars have, have celebrated these recognitions as much needed interventions in, in, in the way in which we are thinking about progressing rights of nature. Um, there's reason to temper the enthusiasm, of course. We can all call to mind the many instances in which legal recognition of rights hasn't effectuated the change we've hoped for. And I think law and humanity scholars in particular have been particularly good at pointing out the instances and the reasons why this hasn't come to be. I think despite this, there's the argument that a rights framework can be helpful, at least discursively and symbolically, because rights not only effectuate legal change, but because they change the narrative around who or what is entitled to legal protection. Um, when we adopt a frame of the rights of nature, we're hoping to effectuate change, not just by ensuring legal protections are in place, but also by changing the narrative around what's entitled to. To say that nature has rights is to remind us that nature is valuable, it's vivacious, it's vulnerable, it's worthy of protection. But I have to say, I'm not totally sold on the rights-based frame. And I have at least three, at least three substantive critiques of it. First, as I mentioned earlier, a rights-based frame is grounded in the idea that law is powerful it can and does reshape our world. But there are lots of reasons to doubt this power of law. I've hinted at a few, and I'll just say for now that there exists a good deal of critical legal scholarship that makes this point. I think that skepticism about the power of law is especially significant in the context of environmental issues. 
What we see time and again is that environmental laws fall short of doing what needs to be done to protect non-human nature. People do all sorts of damaging things that we still call legal. And I think given the most recent case at the Supreme Court, what we see happening, I think we're gonna see a future that restricts rather than enlarges the potential for legal change in pretty significant ways. In contrast, we see progression somewhat in the private sphere as corporations and other private entities adopt measures to aim to reduce their carbon footprint and unify their practices. And to the extent that the real change for, for protection of nature is happening um, through those means, rights discourses don't hold as much sway when we're thinking about these actions in the private realm. The second issue is that the discourse of rights has um, what I would call to be, it, 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 it's poetic. It has an aesthetic quality that inspires, it delights us, it motivates us. It's beautiful, it's imaginative, it evokes feeling. The problem is it doesn't carry a whole lot of meaning, or I should say it doesn't carry a consistent meaning that can be readily applied. Because rights are a funny thing. They operate really differently depending on the source of the right and the context in which one aims to exercise it. So for example, in the US, we have a right to counsel. That right entitles us to different forms of assistance by an attorney at different stages in the criminal process, depending on whether or not we have a right pursuant to the Fifth or Sixth Amendments. So when we see courts declaring that non-human nature has rights, I don't think that actually gets us very far as a practical matter. And I want to suggest that to get us farther, we need rights to be prosaic. We need to know the criteria and the conditions under which those rights will accomplish something or not. It's kind of what Diana was referring to last night in her discussion, thinking concretely. And finally, to my mind, and most significantly, I think the problem with a rights-based frame is it amounts to what environmental philosopher Val Plumwood calls a minimal rethink of the relations between humans and non-human nature. I think it was abundantly evident in the, in the comments of the panel last night, rights is a very human construct. It presupposes a worldview that rights is the proper framework for thinking about relations with each other and with other things. And as scholars of the global South, I think you all recognize the presumption, the hubris inherent in this idea that better treatment follows only after one has acceded to a particular worldview, a view that understands relations between people and among humans and non-human nature as comprised of something that humans have created and recognized as rights. So, what was so expressed so beautifully by the panelists last night is that we need instead a framework that forces a genuine reflection, a genuine reconfiguring of the communities beyond the human. We need to think adjacently, as Leela noted, fluidly, as Marco told us. We should find inspiration in other ways of apprehending the world, as Beth pointed out. And even, and perhaps I think most significantly, we need to think concretely, as Diana suggested. And for that, I suggest we need to think more in terms of equality than rights. We need to reimagine nature as an entity in its own right, one that can be different and unique, but still on equal footing with humans. Because once you stop seeing the protection of nature as part and parcel of furthering human interests, then in theory, we can have a real dialogue about how to accomplish what we want for nature. Of course, we have to contend with human rights. There's always a, a conflict once you put rights into the picture. Um, I don't actually see that as a problem. That's what law is very good at doing. It adjudicates between rights and interests. A government interest to search versus an individual's right against unreasonable searches, a right to free speech versus the right to religious freedom. But law doesn't get to the, that point of dealing with the necessary adjudication unless it first recognizes that two things are more or less on equal footing. So equality, I think, has to, has to precede uh, rights. Thank, thank you very much, Alice. Uh, and, and also, thank you so much for keeping uh, to the seven minutes uh, exemplarily. Uh, me, me paso al castellano. Uh, feel free to uh, use the interpreting uh, function if you'd like to listen in English. Eh, le doy la bienvenida a Alberto Acosta, a quien creo que eh, siguiendo con eh, esta, esta línea ¿no? de, de discusión eh, le cae de perlas ¿no? la pregunta de, de qué se puede hacer con relación al extractivismo desde un contexto institucional. Sería la pregunta, Alberto, y nuevamente bienvenido. Empiezo saludándoles, deseándoles una muy buena noche. Me encuentro en Santiago de Chile, acompañando un proceso sumamente interesante que tiene que ver con la construcción de una nueva constitución. Y muchos de los elementos que de una u otra manera han sido analizados y discutidos, están este rato inspirándose en la imaginación la imaginación y los derechos de la naturaleza. Fue el tema que me invitaron. Y entonces la imaginación es algo tremendamente importante. A primera vista, 
es difícil imaginar que algún día la naturaleza sea sujeto de derechos, pero fue difícil imaginar en algún momento dado que los esclavos africanos tengan derechos, que los pueblos originarios tengan derechos. Ustedes me van a dar la razón, sobre todo las mujeres. Qué difícil es todavía en el mundo, en la actualidad, que las mujeres tengan derechos plenos, que la niñez tenga derechos. Y entonces, antes de abordar la pregunta de Joe, que me parece fundamental, yo quisiera rescatar la importancia que tiene la imaginación. Un señor que entiendo deben haber oído hablar de ustedes de él, Albert Einstein, era una persona que rescataba el valor y el poder de la imaginación. Hay una entrevista que le hacen en el año 1926, van a ser 100 años, en The Saturday Evening Post, casi hace 100 años, y él dice en esa entrevista larga que la imaginación es más importante que el conocimiento. El conocimiento es limitado, la imaginación circunda el mundo está en todas partes en el mundo, es ilimitada. Entonces, me parece a mí que la primera gran tarea que tenemos este rato es recuperar la imaginación como esa fuerza para pensar otros mundos posibles, para dar paso a otros procesos. Lo fundamental es entender, por ejemplo, que no podemos seguir haciendo más de lo mismo que es más de lo peor. Pensemos ya en clave de los extractivismos. Se cree que extraer recursos naturales, petróleo, minerales y otros recursos naturales es una cuestión que puede hacerse permanentemente. Pero estamos viendo que hay límites biofísicos que no pueden ser superados si es que no queremos poner en marcha todo un proceso de desequilibrios permanentes que van a ser cada vez más difícil la vida de los seres humanos en el planeta. No se trata solo de obtener más cantidad de ingresos por los recursos naturales que se extraen del subsuelo. ...con esos recursos naturales, ¿ya? Pensemos lo que representa, por ejemplo, el oro. Aquí Allison nos habló de lo que significaba la minería en la época colonial. El oro, desde hace mucho tiempo atrás, es un mineral muy cotizado. Pero extraemos oro con enormes costos socioambientales. Para extraer una onza de oro se requieren miles de toneladas de material miles de litros de agua, los impactos ambientales son enormes y ¿a dónde se va la mayoría del oro? El oro que realmente utilizamos en nuestras actividades cotidianas no representa ni un 10 ni un 12% del oro que se extrae del subsuelo. Gran parte de ese oro se va para joyas, para especulación y para guardar en los subsuelos de los bancos, ¿ya?, esa es una, una lógica que debería hacernos a nosotros reflexionar. Es un sistema perverso. ¿ya? Estamos destrozando las bases mismas de la existencia de los seres humanos para sostener un proceso de acumulación que se nutre de la codicia, que se nutre de la búsqueda de acumulación permanente de riqueza, que no tiene ningún sentido. Entonces, una primera aproximación a los extractivismos deberíamos hacerlos desde una reflexión un poco más amplia, una reflexión que nos hace a nosotros plantear la necesidad de encontrar alternativas. Un segundo punto importante de los extractivismos es que, de una u otra manera, se van consolidando las sociedades de, la, de las externalidades, sociedades que viven bien, y pienso en Estados Unidos, Canadá, Europa, Japón, porque hay sociedades que viven mal. Esta relación de la explotación de recursos naturales para el bienestar de unos pocos tiene que ser entendida en ese contexto. Y ojo, yo estoy consciente que incluso en los países del sur hay grupos que viven bien 
porque se está explotando la naturaleza y se está explotando a, a las otras comunidades en sus propios países. Entonces, esta es otra lógica que también deberíamos tener en cuenta. Y tenemos entonces también que entender que no podemos seguir imaginándolo un mundo que consuma la misma cantidad de recursos naturales como en épocas anteriores. El panel de cambio climático, el IPCC, por las siglas en inglés, este espacio de Naciones Unidas, nos dice que los impactos ambientales golpean a todos los sectores de la tierra, sean los mares, sean los ríos, sean los territorios, todos los grupos humanos estamos afectados por el impacto ambiental. Y entonces, en esta realidad, uno, no el único, responsable de esa situación son los extractivismos. Les voy a dar una cifra que me imagino que han de haber escuchado ustedes. China, esta economía que está creciendo de una manera acelerada y que sirve de referencia para muchos países en el planeta, en tres años, 2011, 2012, 2013, consumió 6.615 millones de toneladas de cemento. Es mucho, pero hagamos una comparación, tengamos una referencia. 6.615 millones de toneladas de cemento equivalen a más del 1.5 veces del consumo de los Estados Unidos en todo el siglo XX. Esta lógica es insostenible. ¿ya? Y es una cosa que ya se decía desde antes. Es necesario asumir los límites de la Tierra, los límites biofísicos del planeta. Un economista inglés, asesor de presidentes norteamericanos, que ya falleció, Kenneth Boulding, decía que imaginarnos un crecimiento económico permanente en un planeta con límites biofísicos es propio de locos y de economistas. Naturalmente, el asunto es más complicado cuando los economistas están locos y creen que el crecimiento económico puede ser permanente. Y eso es una realidad que nosotros tenemos que entender. Entonces, ¿a dónde quiero llegar yo con esta reflexión sobre los extractivismos? A la necesidad de replantearnos nuestros estilos de vida. A la necesidad de replantearnos la, el reencuentro con los otros seres humanos y el reencuentro con la naturaleza. Y para eso también sirven los derechos de la naturaleza, para tener una relación diferente. Coincido también con Alice cuando dice que hay, ella tiene un escepticismo sobre el poder de la ley. Yo también tengo un escepticismo sobre el poder de la ley. La ley por sí sola, una constitución por sí sola, no resuelve los problemas. Pero una ley o una constitución que sea discutida por la sociedad, que sea el resultado de un proceso de participación social, puede abrir la puerta a procesos interesantes. Yo estoy ahora en Chile, soy ecuatoriano, estoy en Chile apoyando, conociendo, aprendiendo del proceso constituyente de Chile y veo lo difícil y complejo que es pensar en una sociedad como la chilena, la necesidad de superar los extractivismos, el extractivismo minero, el extractivismo agroexportador, pero de todas formas hay elementos que van configurando escenarios que nos permiten, nuevamente vuelvo al principio de mi intervención, dar paso a la imaginación. Imaginémonos mundos que garanticen la vida digna de los seres humanos y de los seres no humanos. Mundos que nos permitan apropiarnos quizás de los avances tecnológicos pero no estar subordinados al desarrollo de la tecnología que no está apuntando a mejorar las condiciones de vida de la gente, sino que está apuntando, por ejemplo, a aumentar la acumulación del capital. ¿Qué es lo que hemos visto en medio del COVID? Un proceso en el cual las grandes empresas farmacéuticas se han enriquecido aceleradamente porque se ha dado paso a otra forma de concentración de la riqueza a través de las vacunas. Y hay países donde la gente tiene la posibilidad de decir, yo no me vacuno, mientras que hay países donde la gente no tiene esa posibilidad porque ni siquiera se presenta la opción de vacunarse o no vacunarse. Entonces, yo les invito 
a hacer una reflexión colectiva, a compartir ideas, a compartir pensamientos y a, a compartir imaginaciones. La imaginación, como decía Einstein, siempre es más importante, más poderosa que el conocimiento. No niego la importancia del conocimiento, pero no podemos nosotros dejar de lado la capacidad de pensar, de soñar y de sentir otros mundos diferentes. Muchas gracias Alberto también por compartirnos esa experiencia chilena tan importante a nivel mundial. Creo que si el, si el 73 fue el comienzo de algo eh, terrible que empezó en Chile, eh, esperamos que el 2022 sea el comienzo de algo maravilloso que empieza también en Chile. And I'll uh, switch to, to English um, to, um, to draw some, some commonalities and share some notes and findings before we have another round of, of answers. And everyone, please feel free to interject at, at any point. Um, let me, you know, in the interest of thinking together, um, get this hypothesis on the table. What if one thing that the imagination can do, um, literary, uh, filmic, uh, artistic, and otherwise, is to maybe bring the externality into the fold? Because externality um, is, is real, and it's actually taught, it's, it's learned. Uh, so when economists, and uh, you know, those of you who are economists know this much better than I do, uh, run a model, they are often taught to leave things outside of the model because the model cannot be reality itself. But then what is left out of the picture um, often comes back to, as it were, you know, bite, bite your, 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 your foot or something, because um, Nature is not an externality. Uh, we are part of nature. We are animals ourselves. There's microbiome in our guts that uh, bind us very directly with our umwelt, with our surroundings. And so externality might be uh, more real for um, economics and for the law than it needs to be for other cultural manifestation and discourses that, that don't think in, in those terms. So that's you know just a, an idea to throw out. Um, also, you know, in my notes here, I, I am um, you know, very inspired by Alison um, telling us how she goes from material to language and vice versa. I mean, methodologically, that's, that's just um, delightful, phenomenal, very important, the kind of combination of colonial law, oral tradition, and technical sources in her book. I'm sure, you know, uh, at the time um, led to consternation from readers who said, oh my goodness, but please, uh, you, you should be uh, talking to one of these audiences and not to all of them at the same time. And yet, because these are um, uh, networks, and, and there I'm thinking a little bit with Bruno Latour, because these phenomena cut across the supposed nature and culture divide, you actually need a footing in different sub-disciplines to make sense of the whole, because otherwise you're, you're, you really aren't, uh, you know, grasping the, the, the essence of the problem. Um, and I was also really, you know, delighted and, uh, to hear from uh, Alice about um, the aspirational <laughs> dimension of the rights framework. Um, we, we heard that Uh, similarly uh, from Diana yesterday, it also worries me um, in that I, 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 you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I see that there is this um, fetishistic perhaps, but real power of the law that when we are critical of the law, and I think we should be, I worry that for some years, that sounds like, oh, the law then is, is of, of no relevance and anyone can do as, as they please. It, it's as if, you know, you point at the judge's wig and you call it a wig, you know? Um, so, so I wonder, uh, perhaps in a, in a little, um, uh, you know, reaction, uh, at least, what are the, the limits, right, of, of interrogating the, the law uh, as sympathetic as I am to, to, to doing so, right? And especially the, the rights, uh, framework. 
And then more recently we heard Alberto, but I'll, I'll share some of my notes here. Um, note how these terms um, made their way into uh, Alberto's presentation. Biophysical, biophysical, very straightforward, <laughs> very clear. It's not physics, it's not biology, it's biophysic and it makes perfect sense. Or socioambiental, so socio, socio environmental, one could say, right? Um, and, and these kinds of portmanteau, um, I think, are uh, indicative of the importance of thinking always already in an interdisciplinary fashion to conduct something like, you know, law and humanities or even law and non-humanities uh, research. Um, so those are some reactions. And, and I know we have other questions that I'd like to circulate, but I know I don't know if at this point anyone would have any kind of spontaneous or, or um, off the cuff remark they, they'd like to add. I'll jump in really quickly. Um, and I had two, I guess one is, as you're pointing out, we need um, imagination to, to kind of bring externality into the fold. And, and one of the things I would, I would take that step further and say, we need something to spark our imagination. Our imagination is necessarily limited. There, it, it is not infinite. And, and I think um, that's part of what we can think about as, as why that toolbox, as you put it, is, is so important, is that it's giving us tools in which to enlarge the imagination or expand it. Um, uh, methods, uh, like Allison is pointing out, this idea of, of, of imagining things through metals, which, which blows my mind, um, and is already expanding it. Um, I, I think, um, I think it's important to, to, to take out those kind of celebration of the imagination and then think about um, how do we how do we expand that? And I guess to that point, um, I'll answer your, your question directly about the fear of, of uh, what we do when we critique law. And, and, and I will say, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that critique is only possible because of the particular laws uh, that surround me and that sustain me and because of where I am located, that, that, that this kind of critique is not possible everywhere. And, and so I, I need to acknowledge that and, and recognize that um, it, law is, is, is what makes critique possible or, or impossible. I, I guess I just want to clarify um, that I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have law and I'm not saying that uh, it, it, it's not something that's desirable. I'm saying the law gives us a variety of different frames. And so we have a choice of frames. And I, I don't know that the rights-based framework is the appropriate frame and that there are other frames that we can be selecting or, or, or utilizing um, that might get us to a place where we wanna go. And we don't have to reject law to do that. I think, I think it's absolutely right. We, we need law, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship, um, but we need to be careful about which parts we, we, we are uh, extracting from law in order to and to make that 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 relationship uh, function. Thank you. Yes, Alison, please. Yes, um, para complementar, fue muy bonito escuchar lo que dijo Alberto porque toda la idea de mi libro nació en Chile. Cuando me gradué de la universidad, empecé a enseñar clases de inglés en una mina de cobre en el norte de Chile. Y fue ahí, pues mi turno era cuatro por tres. O sea, pasé cuatro días en la mina y tres días afuera, enseñando un día clases en Iquique y dos días de descanso. Y a través de esta experiencia de ser una de las siete mujeres que estaba en, el, en la mina durante mi turno, me, me llegó la idea de investigar un poco desde la perspectiva humanística el lenguaje de la minería. Así que, pues solo quiero felicitar todo el trabajo que está haciendo. Me parece fenomenal eh, todo lo que están haciendo ahí con la Constitución y felicidades. Y fue, fue muy bonito así saber un poco más de esta historia. Maravilloso, realmente. Es, es, es un privilegio tener este intercambio. Eh, OK, let me, and, and it's wonderful. Also, we can uh, make this work across languages. Uh, I know Maria Teresa Villalesis is, is very busy there working in the background. Um, take, take a breather, Maria Teresa. <laughs> we have another round of questions to go. Much appreciated. Um, so in uh, trying to come up with a format that uh, accommodates the Zoom reality, um, we proposed our panelists uh, another question. But this time, it's a question that is common to all. 
uh, and of course build on uh, their previous research. Um, let me go over my, my notes here as I've been taking too many of them already. Um, so here's the, the big picture question and let me unpack it for um, everyone here as well. Thinking about non-human rights, when is cultural production part of the solution and when is it part of the problem? When is cultural production part of the solution? When is it part of the problem? Um, if you would indulge a, a footnote here, uh, drawing on a, on a different um, time period, I am reminded of how um, Armando Matelart and Ariel Dorfman uh, critiqued Donald Duck from Chile in the early 1970s under the Unidad Popular um, uh, government. Um, they, they claimed that Donald Duck was imperialistic. They claimed that Donald Duck was um, maybe a brainwashing, uh, that I don't think would be too strong a term for them, um, Chileans, right, into a certain affinity with uh, the US. And so Donald Duck uh, in the 70s for uh, Matilar and Dorfman was indeed part of the problem, right? So it's, uh, we're used to saying that culture is great, the imagination we, we just heard is great, but what happens if sometimes uh, culture is actually part of the problem? Um, specifically for non-human rights, um, they have a different valence in the global north than they do in the global south because for 500 years, uh, the, the flows of capital, the flows of commodities have been from the south to the north, right? We, we, we just, this is so huge that, you know, we, for, for much that globalization is to, supposed to be more horizontal, um, it's best not to forget, right, that, that it, it might be horizontal now in some ways, and yet these flows are, are uh, really, um, you know, long in the making and, and have many consequences. Some subtopics that our speakers may want to engage with include uh, non-Western cosmologies and worldviews. It's very different to talk about something like Donald Duck than to talk of uh, non-Western uh, cultural production or non-Western ways of, of, of living in the world. Uh, we could address uh, in the footsteps of yesterday's conversation, the role of the liberal subject as a juridical and philosophical construct. Uh, we could talk about specific uh, junctures in political ecology. And of course, examples from uh, your work are most welcome. Um, this time around, maybe I, I suggest we hear from uh, Alice first, Alberto second, and Alison third. Uh, and and uh, sorry for constantly having to mediate. This is what, what Zoom has, has become of us. Uh, so again, uh, Alice, uh, when is cultural production part of the solution of non-human rights? When is it part of the problem? So I, I guess my previous response, I talked about law as a form of cultural production. Um, law generates a narrative that leaves us understanding nature as somehow full of rights, but rights are somehow subsumed by human needs and desires. Um, so I wanna focus my comments here on a different form of cultural production. Um, because I think it's important to define what, what we mean by the cultural production. Here I'm going to focus specifically on, on that which we find in literature. Um, I, I think scholars of, of law and literature have, have long suggested that literature can be antagonistic to law. It can challenge the conceptual foundations of law by, among, among other things, um, helping us to imagine alternate realities. Literature is, 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 is kind of what I was referencing when I was thinking about how, what do we look to to expand our imagination. It gives us a way to imagine a reality that, 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 that is different from law. It troubles the very outcomes of legal opinions as the only or even the best solutions. It forces us to confront the artificiality of distinctions that the law seemingly takes for granted. Uh, distinctions between the natural and the human, the natural and the social and cultural the great divide that Bruno Latour uh, references. This is not to say that literature avoids, I think the many faults of law when it comes to conceptualizing non-human nature. I think uh, historians and eco-critics, critical theorists among, among others, um, reveal the myriad of ways in which we tend to exoticize, fetishize uh, non-human nature. Uh, we craft it into an idealized antithesis of our most unnatural civilization. Um, and I think as in law, this othering serves a purpose. It, it serves ultimately uh, a, a, a very human purpose. 
Um, in, in the article that Hector uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, I talk about Shel Silverstein's popular children's book, The Giving Tree, the, the story that tells a, a tale of a boy who loves a tree. It supplies him with a trunk to climb and fruit to eat and wood to build. Um, and, and it does so throughout his life. And the very last portrait is of the boy who's turned into an old man. And the tree is nothing more than a stump upon which he sits. And both, supposedly, is what Shel Silverstein tells us, that, that they're both happy. And even though this is a children's book, it's not lofty literature. I, I think that story serves as a great example of how literature can and does sustain representations of non-human nature as made for consumption by humans, how the rights of nature can and will be subsumed by human rights. This is a, this is a sense where, where I think cultural production is part of the problem. I also wanna suggest that literature can and it does do more than that. And here's where it might be part of a solution. Um, as, a, as, as I've talked about in this previous work, um, literature can give us what, what Richard Powers calls a good story. And that's, I think, my, my answer to this question, um, which was asked to the panelists last night of, of what law in literature should and, and can do. It should help us define a good story. And what does a good story do? A good story provides the impetus and the model for a new way of imagining relations with non-human nature. A good story exists in Power's novel, The Overstory, which we use together human and arboreal lives. It exists in Peter Wollobin's The Hidden Life of Trees, which whatever doubts we have about scientific merits pushes us to reconsider our perceptions of trees as inanimate objects incapable of communicating. It exists in uh, Standing Bear's memoir that Beth referenced last night in the, in the stories about thugs that Leela talked about. Um, it's what I think is inherent in the concept of imagination that Alberto was discussing tonight and in Allison's eloquent plea for, for reading medals alongside language. I wanna be clear as I'm thinking about this idea of the good story. Um, it, it's not something that's found only in fiction. Stories are told in all sorts of texts, not just law, not just, not just novels, um, but texts that we refer to as literature, poetry and novels, plays, but other things too, scientific analyses, uh, uh, metal even. Um, and I think it's really important to note too, um, as, as Marco made so clear in his writing and his discussion last night, that the good story doesn't even have to be written down. There are abundant stories created through the visual medium. And just by way of example, to talk about how these stories are, are, are told in the context of thinking about nature, I've been working on a new project thinking about how uh, we, we generate narratives of eco-crime um, and, and looking at mass media images and the ways in which these stories not only tell a narrative about what counts as a crime against nature, but the ways in which stories uh, further kind of tropes that we have about crime in general, including the racialized tropes that we have about, uh, about crime and criminals. And I think it's important too, uh, uh, engaging with this question about bringing in other cosmologies and worldviews, um, that when we're looking for this good story, um, it, it is really helpful to look to different cosmologies, different worldviews. But I wanna also um, make sure we're careful of avoiding othering and fetishizing that's too often um, the result of when we, when we look beyond Western literature. And what I mean to say is, is, is look to these stories, these other stories, um, and appreciate them for the stories that they in fact tell, for their power to push us outside of our comfort zone, to generate a good story precisely because they reconfigure however momentarily, our way of imagining the world and our relations to the people um, and things in it. And I think the value of chasing this good story is that the stories might shift what we'll, what we'll call the break framework narratives. This, th these narratives that, that Alberto rightly pointed out that we, we, we think that, that, that law creates, but law is only creating it within, within a, a normal way of understanding the world. I think we need to shift that, that, that normal way, that natural way of understanding the world. Um, and, and, and the kind of narratives that dictate how we should relate to non-human nature, whether that nature bears rights or not. Um, and I think when those kinds of big frameworks shift, that's when I think we can start seeing a shift in the stories that law tells that we're capable of telling about law. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, Alberto, te, te damos la palabra. El, el problema para mí es que Como economista, tengo muchas limitaciones para hablar de cuentos. Yo soy solo economista. Nadie es perfecto. Y entonces eso me impide profundizar como ustedes esperarían en estos temas. Y además tengo otro problema y muy grave. Que este tipo de conversaciones deberíamos hacerlas no de forma virtual, sino presencial. Me imagino, por ejemplo, 
que podríamos tener inclusive una copa de buen vino chileno para poder compartir más alegremente. Me gustaría mucho conocer esas experiencias en la mina que tiene Allison. Tienen que ser apasionantes. Tienen que ser algo realmente digno de escuchar. Me gustaría discutir con Alice sobre la fuerza que tiene el derecho, la importancia que tiene el derecho, pero el riesgo de creer que las leyes y la Constitución resuelven los problemas. Yo me he hecho una pregunta. Fue muy importante, sin lugar a dudas, el hecho de que los afroamericanos hayan dejado de ser esclavos. Fue un avance en el derecho, no solo en los Estados Unidos, sino en toda nuestra América. Pero ya no son esclavos y no ha desaparecido el racismo. ¿No sirve entonces el derecho? Pregunta falsa, equivocada. Sí sirve el derecho. Lo que a mi juicio no estamos entendiendo es que el derecho es solo parte de un proceso de construcción cultural. Y esos procesos de construcción cultural son complejos, son difíciles. Me gustó muchísimo que hayan mencionado al Donald Duck, al Pato Donald. Y en Historia del Pato Donald, que yo la leí de niño con mucha frecuencia, habían varios personajes, porque no era solo el Pato Donald. El Pato Donald es una suerte de personaje crítico en la familia Donald. ¿ya? Es una suerte de anarquista de la familia. El que representa la esencia de la familia es el tío Macpato, el rico, el que acumula. Pero el Pato Donald no cae en esa trampa. Y los sobrinos del Pato Donald también juegan un papel importante. Entonces, no sé en qué medida esas lecturas múltiples desde la literatura nos pueden abrir la puerta a distintas aproximaciones culturales. Claro, hay un problema en estos cuentos del Pato Donald, de Mickey Mouse, de Pluto y de todos los otros personajes de Walt Disney, que humanizan a los animales y le sacan de su entorno propio. ¿ya? Y los animales civilizados son los que pueden transmitirnos a nosotros los mensajes. Creo que eso también es parte de estas lecturas que están recogiendo un hecho muy preocupante, que los seres humanos que asumimos ser civilizados nos colocamos figurativamente hablando al margen de la naturaleza. La naturaleza es lo salvaje y la civilización está por otro lado. Entonces, el pato Donald, Mickey Mouse y todos estos animales humanizados para compartir nuestro mundo tienen que salir del ámbito de la naturaleza. Y eso configura entonces todo un escenario a través del cual seguimos imaginándonos a la naturaleza como subordinada a los seres humanos. Yo creo que estos son también temas interesantes. Me pareció genial que hayas recordado, Alice, la figura de Huckleberry Finn, ese niño eh, pobre que vive allá en el sur de los Estados Unidos, y que abraza un árbol, que también es otra forma de acercarnos a la naturaleza. Y enseguida me vino una figura, estoy muy sensibilizado con el tema de la discusión de los derechos de la naturaleza. ¿Le habrá influenciado? Me pregunto, no sé, solo pregunto. Esa figura de Huckleberry Finn abrazando los árboles a Christopher Stone, el abogado que defendió a los árboles secoyas gigantes de California, y se preguntó, que si los árboles tienen derecho a seguir de pie, a seguir existiendo. No sé, le hago esas preguntas, porque la literatura nos permite a nosotros aproximarnos a esa capacidad de imaginación que tenemos los seres humanos. Y me vino igualmente, yo, no, yo soy solo economista, no soy experto en literatura, no soy experto en temas de derecho, pero permanentemente me pregunto si es que las cosas siempre fueron así o tuvieron que cambiar. En esta búsqueda de los orígenes de los derechos de la naturaleza que vienen de los pueblos originarios, que hay reflexiones científicas, Lovejoy, Margulis, por ejemplo, que hay reflexiones filosóficas que podríamos encontrar en Baruch de Spinoza y muchas otras personas más, que hay reflexiones religiosas que parten desde Francisco de Asís hasta el Papa Francisco con la encíclica Laudato Si. También hay 
reflexiones que vienen de la literatura. Hay un libro de un escritor, Ítalo Calvino, que publica en el año 1957 una trilogía. Y uno de los libros de la trilogía es La vida de un joven que se pelea con sus padres, una familia noble en Italia, en el norte de Italia, se pelea con sus padres y vive toda su vida subido en los árboles. El varón rampante se llama en español, no sé cómo se llamará en inglés, el varón rampante. Y este joven que vive en los árboles, es una novela escrita en el año 1957 o publicada en el año 1957, tiene una conversación con Napoleón. Napoleón pasa por esa parte de Italia y él estaba en uno de los árboles. Y él le dice a Napoleón que debería pensar en incorporar en una nueva constitución los derechos a las mujeres, los derechos a la niñez y los derechos de la naturaleza. Entonces yo creo que esta capacidad de imaginación que tiene la literatura nos abre puertas para replantearnos aquellas tradiciones que creemos inamovibles. Y en su primera intervención, Alice nos dijo que es importante cambiar el orden de aproximación a las tradiciones. Yo creo que esa es una de las grandes tareas que tenemos entre manos. No hay que rechazar las tradiciones, pero hay que, hay que entenderlas en su contexto y tratar de identificar cuáles problemas de esas tradiciones podrían ser parte de esa construcción que tiene elementos negativos y cuáles podrían tener elementos positivos para las transformaciones. Me parece que esta noche me voy a quedar pensando antes de dormirme en todas estas cosas que nos abren la mente, nos permiten pensar en mundos diferentes, en cuestionar las cosas que hacemos cotidianamente. Y les agradezco y te agradezco a ti, yo. Maravilloso, Alberto. Eh, vamos a, a darle la palabra a Alison. Uh, if, if you would, please, Alison. Thanks so much. Um, I also would love to be in person, um, but I'm, I am five months pregnant, so I wouldn't be able to have wine. So that just means we have to do this later. Uh, with, I'll have two kids under the age of three and we'll definitely need all the wine. Um, I, sorry, there's a fire truck going by. Um, I took the question a little bit more literally and tried to think of one example that sort of illustrated the paradoxes of thinking about the, the advantages and disadvantages of cultural production. And where I landed was with the film Tambien la Lluvia. I imagine that this might be something that many of you in the room have taught or have seen in a class. Um, and it's the kind of film that on the one hand, for students who are for the first time thinking about issues of indigenous movements and Um, yeah, it's on Netflix, um, which makes it super easy to teach. Um, uh, water rights, land issues, political struggle, it's a really good introduction. On the other hand, it is a film in which the non-Native people are the centers. I mean, the whole story revolves around them. And it's almost impossible in a class discussion because people start focusing on the protagonists to sort of bring, bring the students back to what's happening and why it is that we're being told to focus over here on these white folks instead of what's happening with the Bolivian leaders. Um, it's also a film you know, by a Spanish director and production company and that has its own history of exploitation and what they paid the extras um, to make the film. And to a certain extent, depending on the class that you're teaching it in, you know, you can teach that conflict, but it's, um, it's hard to get at all of those levels, particularly if you have students who are maybe not as, this is the first time they're thinking about Latin American cultural studies or global South cultural studies. Um, we also watch those kinds of films on devices that are made with extractive materials produced by children, um, produced by women and men who are working in absolutely inhumane conditions. And so for as much as the film opens up discussion and helps students think about these things, it also is reinforcing all of the traps of extractivism. And so for me, that the, I kind of landed there with the question, um, when is cultural production part of the solution and when is it part of the problem? Well, it's always both because there's no outside of culture. We're, we're 
in it from the, the way that we think about it to the language we use to the devices that we use to communicate. Um, there's no getting outside of it, except maybe in this in the space of the imagination, the space beyond language, the space beyond the body, the space beyond our own experiences. Um, and that I think is really exciting. Um, and I'm, I'm especially interested to hear what kinds of sources people are teaching in the classroom to get students to think about the role of the imagination and ways to get outside of the, the trap or the double bind of cultural production. Um, and I can tell that I failed uh, when I taught Tambien La Lluvia in my class on Literatura Indígena because I had three students out of 20 tell me that that was their favorite indigenous text of the semester. And it was just, <laughs> it's probably not something I should admit on camera, but at the same time, it really helped me learn, okay, I've got to rethink the whole way I'm teaching this, this text and really frame it for them in a, a way that I had not done. Um, and I, so I'd also like to hear just the experiences of others, you know, what cultural productions have been total failures when you've tried to teach these issues or, um, and what have been some of the successes. So thanks very much. And looking forward to everyone's thoughts. Thank, thank you, Alison, uh, Alberto and Elise. Um, I, I, I have underlined again, a, a couple of, of, of findings here. Um, Alice uh, set us out on, on the note of thinking of law as part of cultural production. And Alison, you know, very interestingly, also spoke about the no outside of culture. Um, you know, that, that imminent realm, I think, is, is something to think more about. Uh, it, it dawns on me that, you know, focalization, the thing that us literary critics called focalization, what character you're going to be following around and so on and so forth, is indeed a political problem and it can be a political ecological problem so you kind of need you know to train in in, in um, the techniques of good literary criticism sometimes to intervene and then alberto uh pointed us in the direction of a really great example huckleberry finn alberto please uh cuando quieras por favor El, el ejemplo de Huckleberry Finn fue de Alice, no mío. Pero creo que es importante seguir dándole la vuelta a estas ideas de la producción cultural. Es de cuestiones más sencillas. Ya les dije, me, me, me pusieron en marcha el engranaje y comienzo a, a hacerle trabajar a la neurona. Entonces, me recuerdo, por ejemplo, una obra escrita, que está en el cine también, que es Robinson Crusoe. ¿ya? La idea de que una persona, un individuo, puede vivir aislado y puede resolver los problemas manteniendo sus tradiciones inglesas en un ámbito hostil de la naturaleza, tratando de controlar y dominar la naturaleza sin integrarse, sin buscar una simbiosis, un equilibrio con la naturaleza. Es el hombre blanco que vive solo, individuo aislado, y eso parte de un principio fundamental que era en esa época, estamos hablando más de 100 años atrás, de recuperar el individuo en medio de una sociedad que se caracterizaba por autoritarismos. Pero me parece que también habría que darle la vuelta. Y me vino a la memoria una película que me gustó mucho, que recoge la idea de... Eh, un pueblo originario que vive un tiempo con Robinson Crusoe, pero Ryder, no sé si vieron la película, con Peter O'Toole, ¿ya? que es una película, Ryder cuenta la historia de Robinson Crusoe, y yo creo que eso también nos lleva a estas dobles lecturas, estas dobles aproximaciones para tratar de desmistificar esas producciones culturales que están dentro de la lógica de la modernidad. El individuo en libertad, garantizando la, la solución de sus propias necesidades en un egoísmo absoluto, es el que va a resolver los problemas. Y exactamente eso es parte de los graves problemas que vivimos. Estamos en una situación en la cual se ha deshumanizado la humanidad.
es tan grave este asunto, y a mí eso me, me llama la atención, que hay países ricos como Inglaterra y como Japón, donde se ha establecido el Ministerio de la Soledad para atender esa situación de individualismo extremo. Entonces, pensando en la necesidad de transformaciones, tenemos... reencontrar porque, porque hay mucho para seguir con gracias Alberto um, I, I, I'd also like to point out regarding uh, Robinson Crusoe and, and we, we've had in the in the chat a, a comment about um, the quote unquote female Robinson Crusoe uh, Uh, Elisa Winfield's uh, female protagonist. This is an observation by from Cynthia, I believe, or from Allison. It's, it's a little hard for me to tell looking at the chat. Uh, Cynthia then remarks uh, about consumerism and the new iPhone. We, we're, we're gathering some questions in the Q&A, so I think it's almost time to, to segue into a different portion of, of our meeting. But before we go there, uh, I just wanted to mention that Robinson Crusoe is the example that uh, Karl Marx uses in Capital to articulate the notion of commodity fetishism. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I hate to you know, do a plug of, of my, my book, uh, Things with a History here, but I, I do engage with, with that, Alberto. I, I'd love to send you a, a copy at, at some point. We, we'll, we'll correspond, but, um, but that's also problematic because what uh, Marx does in terms of thinking about raw material, which is a, a concept that is very real for economists, Um, is, is also a, a, a bit of an ecological calamity, right? When, when you start of seeing things as, as raw material. Um, that, that might be a, a conversation for, for a different moment, perhaps. Um, I, I don't know, Joe, if, if you'd like to add a question, uh, you, you've been organizing this, you know, uh, sp spearheading it. I, I don't know if you'd like to, to add a question. Um, same, uh, Romina, Jimena, uh, Cristal, Joe. Okay, so I, I, I see that as, as a pass. Uh, Jimena, <laughs> your mic is on. Uh, yeah, well, I want to start by thanking everyone because it has been really fascinating to, to hear you and to learn from you. Um, I, was, I was trying to, so I, I, I was trying to, um, put my thoughts together, but I'm not sure it's going to come out so articulate. So <laughs> I'll just try and make the best of it. Um, I wonder if uh, there is a way in which we, because I, 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 I agree with Alison and I think she puts it so beautifully in that there would be um, no externality when we're discussing cultural production because from where can we uh, position ourselves right but at the same time externality has been a term of the discussion and I was one today I mean and I was wondering if there is a way in which we could discuss how um, this um, forms of adjacency, I think it was the term that you that we used from yesterday, or this uh, living in relationship that we imagine when we imagine the um, um, assemblages in from cultural nature, can be thought of in terms of power. When we discuss literature and law together, we're trying to figure out how, um, and these were terms from yesterday as well, there is a Uh, I think um, Hayan talked about parsimonious, um, parsimoniously in, in, in law and literature is supposed to be more um, vibrant or uh, powerful to bring my, my example. So I, my term, sorry. So I'm thinking of ter in, in terms of power, constituent power, destituent power. Um, and these are terms of course from Agan Ben and maybe not um you know uh possible to bring in in the in, in in his terms tonight but in the conversation if we could go back to this idea of a, a, a contest of power 
right, between law and literature and the possibilities to produce culturally a way to um, illuminate more this inequality of power that we see when we when when we're trying to um, think of the um, externalities that are in that 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 produce the the um, or that that allow for the uh, for the economic inequalities or social inequalities i wonder if we could put more i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm just i i feel like i'm going in circles right now but i'm trying to to ask you to talk more about um difference in power when we are trying to uh, or oppositions of power when 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 we go into into these examples i'm not sure if if I'm making myself clear, because I think I feel I, I I lost my train of thought, but I'm just I'm just thinking that the problem with um, the right the rights of nature, um, to my mind, bring about the problem of once you have um, changed the law, there is a, a constituted power that is going to come in place and it's going to repeat the same. Um, dialects of violence that we have seen before, and I'm thinking with Benjamin. So, how to break that is the question, right? Um, do we do we need to bring in another constituent power through law, or is there another way? Not only you know, uh, yeah, we go into um, uh, uh, forms of imagination, but 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 more putting pressure on this power of law. I. I I'll leave it there because I think I I just didn't <laughs> make it so clear. I'm sorry. I'll just say I really appreciate uh, you working through and articulating that because we were seeing we were seeing the synapses forming, we were seeing the neurons firing, and and that that I actually think is a really exciting thing, and I'm 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 enjoying thinking along with you, and and I actually am enjoying the 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 the, the, the travels that you brought us on. Um, I actually think it's a really good question. And I actually think um, it, it's a good question because it points us to two things, which is um, one of the things that can sometimes be frustrating about these conversations is it's easy to critique. It is easy to, to, to talk in abstract terms. And then the inevitable question is, so what do we do differently? And, 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 and so what alternative is there? And, and, I, and I actually think that's an, an incredibly important question to ask. And it's something that, that strengthens the critique that we're trying to make. Um, I, I think the constituent, I, I think your, your, other, your, your bigger question about how we uh, change or, or how we deal with, with the, the, what, what we see as a constituent power, both, both of law and, and other forms of cultural production. I mean, it is, it is a constituent power and let's not kid ourselves. They all have constitutive powers, um, constitutive powers. Um, I wonder, I, I'm I'm fascinated by this idea about there's there's no externality, and I don't know if there might be an answer in that. In that, um, I think part of the power derives from the ability to make us see externalities, and part of the power derives from the ability to say, uh, "Here is here, and there is there." And I and I wonder if, um, in some ways, disrupting that power is is being able to reconfigure those boundaries between here and there. Um, and I don't think you have to meet whatever is doing the constituting with, with, with equivalent constituting. If it's a law that's constituting that way, you don't necessarily meet it with a law. And in fact, um, I, I, I can think of, of, of um, some clear examples even from, from recent constitutional law in the US. Um, a, a, a good example is, is, is gay rights, for example, that, that law is, is saying, uh, here's the families, here are the people who have particular rights, there are the people that don't. And the way that, could, that constitution is, is met that is is not through law, but through through a, a broader narrative about um, who actually um, who who families are, and that and that I think that 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 narrative is coming from lots of different areas in law, but it meets law somehow, and and we and I think it's interesting to think about the spaces in which it meets the law, um, where, where where are those spaces, um, but somehow it's meeting it there, and it, and it is pushing it, and it is changing the boundaries between here and there. Um, that's just me thinking aloud. I, I think it's a great question, and I really appreciate the way in which you um, thought through it and talked through it. I think it's something that, that that's really good to think with. 
let, let, let me interject um, as a timekeeper here, because um, I know it, it is late in Santiago de Chile. Um, uh, you know, one thing, Jimena, that, that your observation brought to mind is, is we've been biased towards construction, towards building, constituting, right? And it's great because that's what Alberto is doing, right? He's constituting, uh, literally, but um, but there is there's space for, for critique and 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 uh, deconstituting, undoing. It's it's not all doing. Doing is important, but there's so much undoing that needs to happen. Um, on, on that note, um, let, let me ask Joe if you wouldn't mind pressing the, the stop recording button for us.